Hello, welcome back to Chatting with Chap. This is Ro with Rose Resource Room. And I am here with Jennifer. And I've never met Jennifer. So Jennifer, welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Can you please give us a quick introduction and tell us a little bit about your homeschool journey? Sure. My name is Jennifer Cook DeRosa, and I'm a homeschool mom to four sons. I graduated my last son from homeschool this past May. So they are all officially now through that process. I made it out alive and <laughs> they, they all earned college credit in high school and went on to finish their degrees and certificates and diplomas and things like that after high school. And so, um, of course, we're going to talk about earning college credit in high school today, um, but it was really a, a big part of my journey as a homeschool mom personally, and one that was really um, pivotal in bringing homeschooling for college credit as an organization um, forward. So um, all of all of my boys turned out fine, normal. It, <laughs> it was some aspects were harder than I expected, but a lot of aspects were were actually easier than I expected. Um, and so I would encourage any parent that's kind of on the verge of entering high school, if they're not sure, if they've been homeschooling and it's going well, I would encourage them to keep doing that. Um, and so, yeah, we can we can share more about that um, today if you, if you like and, and talk more about that. But we homeschooled from day one. So all of our kids went from preschool, which of course I started with my first one way too soon. Um, but that's mm. okay, right? You can do, you can homeschool a two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so all the way through, so grand total of 28 years of homeschool. Oh my gosh. Wow. So first of all, congratulations to you for graduating <laughs> your final son. That is amazing. You did it. Um, second of all, I'm also a boy mom. I have three boys. They are nine, seven, and one. Oh, very good. Boys are great. I think so. It's funny because I was out with a group of moms yesterday and I said, so how does this work? Because I never homeschool from the beginning. So I was like, how does this work? When exactly do I need to start teaching this kid the alphabet? And they're like, he's one, <laughs> leave him alone. I'm like, wait, what? you know, so I would love to hear your perspective because you talked about starting too soon. And I know that public schools are sending kids home with worksheets as early as two or three what would you consider too soon? And what were kind of like your lessons learned looking back? Like, you know what? Maybe I could have done that differently. Well, I really do think that that what, you know, what kind of feels right for your family is probably right. Um, so I'm not trying to, you know, tell another parent how to homeschool. I, I, I think that most of us have good intuition, but what I think happens is we get talked into things mm. because of peer pressure and that we feel kind of that everyone around us maybe is doing more or they're doing it better than we are. And so, you know, I, of course, also experienced that and, you know, felt that pressure to, to do more, to be more, to bring more to the table mm -hmm. when my kids were young. And so with my oldest, our guinea pig, right. Um, <laughs> it's, I always think back about that experience. And I mean, I, I don't laugh because I was very, um, I was very intentional and I was very determined to do a good job. Yeah. And so I, I'm not, I'm not being down on myself for that approach, but as I added more kids to, uh, you know, our homeschool, as we grew as a family, as, um, it started to become more dynamic and more challenging to homeschool for children, I had to let some things slide. And so initially that kind of felt like I was dropping the ball. But what ended up happening as time went on is I realized that it was a little healthier to not maybe be so intense. <laughs> and so as, as things kind of went on and, um, you know, we reinvented our homeschool so many times, so many times over those years and how it looked in the very early days was not how it ended up in the end. And so I, I, I hate to say, you know, don't start too early, but because that just shows enthusiasm. Um, but maybe focusing on the whole person instead of just the academics would be my advice. So clearly God sent you here to talk to me directly. This is not <laughs> about chat. This is not about the convention. This is you talking to me. A Enthusiastic is a nice way to put it. <laughs> um, a checklist oriented, systematic person who's like, I need to fill out all these boxes. And you're saying there is no one right way because all families are different. And the part you talked about intuition, I'm like, yes, that's it. 
there's so many times when my friends have called me and they're like, hey, you know, I was thinking this, but then I talked to such and such and they said I should do this. And we ignore that piece and we believe the lies about another family is doing it better. And I'm that person at two o'clock in the morning looking at a better curriculum. So when you said you reinvented so many times, I'm like, oh, I guess it's just a normal part of the process, right? Because the flip side of that would be being rigid. Like I bought this curriculum, we're doing it this way and that's it. And you're saying it's okay to lean into that flexibility that it naturally offers. If something is not working, then don't use it. And if something is working or it needs to be improved, that's okay too. But really leading into that flexibility. So thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I think, I do think it's important that we give homeschooling our attention, right? That we give it our brain space. And I don't, I don't think it's a mistake necessarily to look at that curriculum at two in the morning. I mean, I've done that too. Um, but you know, with time comes a little bit of wisdom and what you Mm -hmm. can do is you can look at those curriculum at two o'clock in the morning. You can go to those conventions and see all the wonderful vendors, but you learn how to filter and you mm-hmm. learn how to leave some of the things that don't make sense for your family. So it's, it's, I think at least for me in the very beginning, it was trying everything to see what maybe was good. Um, but then as, as I kind of got more experience with my kids, not experience with your kids, right. But yeah. experience with my kids, yeah. I was able to know who they weren't. And mm-hmm. I think that was really, um, very important. Um, my oldest, I really had a lot of ideas of who he was going to become. But by the time I had my fourth and he was starting high school, we, you know, my husband and I both would, would be able to have a different conversation about, we knew who he was and maybe how to, um, help him find his path to success. Mm, I really love that. Why aren't you doing this encouragement at the, at the convention? Let me call Ginger. I don't need to hear about oh, high school. I, this hope is what to, I, need to... I hope to encourage people at the okay, convention. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So we're going to do, uh, I've got three, I think that I'm speaking on Thursday. And, you know, I do think that one of the things that sometimes happens is parents will attend a convention to be told what to do, but I don't tell parents what to do. I show parents how to do something. So if you come to my workshops on, on that day, um, I'm going to show you some things, how to do them, but, um, you know, we can also always work in lots of time for questions and answers and things like that. And, and, you know, a lot of times it's just being able to ask the question that really is helpful to a parent. Right. Yeah. Well said. All right. So let's talk about high school because you said, you know, sometimes we start too early. Like I'm that homeschool mom who has a one-year-old saying, when exactly do I bring this book out? When exactly do I start teaching the alphabet? How early is too early for thinking about high school or is there no such thing? No, that's a great question because one of the things that at least happened with me and does happen sometimes is that because we um, start kind of early, we mm-hmm. approach high school pretty early. And so mm-hmm. we have a very young student going into middle school. And then therefore we have a young student going into high school. Yeah. And so this is actually a problem sometimes because in high school, you have a lot of, a lot of things that are different for a homeschooler than we're in from kindergarten through eighth grade. So okay. in high school, we have to start keeping a record called a transcript. And the transcript documents the courses, the credits, and the grades that your student earned, grades nine through 12. So parents begin to say, well, you know, uh, what if we do this? What if we do that? How will that look on the transcript? And so it does bring a lot of different questions and concerns. One of the pieces that we kind of deal with in our organization is earning college credit, and you can earn college credit in any grade. So what happens is sometimes the parents will have lots of college credit on the high school transcript and they get to the point where they think, gosh, we've got all this credit. Should we graduate our, our son or daughter early? And so what happens is when you start early, you hit graduation early and that's not always a good thing. Mm-hmm. Is it more because of maturity? Like why would it be a, a good big thing? Part. I mean, maturity is a big part. But the other thing to think about is if you are sending your student off to college, do you really want to send your student at 16 or 17? And a lot of parents say no. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, just one thing really quickly, let me just say, um, when you are in high school or for that matter, when you're in uh, any grade, the college credit that you earn is reduced tuition or free for many parents. 
And the other thing is that it's protected against turning them into a transfer student. So your student can earn tons of credit in high school. They will never apply to college as a transfer student. But when you graduate high school, you now, no matter where you live, no matter what age they are, you're going to pay full price. And all the credit that they earn after that point does turn them into a transfer student. So there's a lot of reasons staying in high school is a good idea. And I see. one of the things we did just personally um, was my sons, because they had summer birthdays, they all ended up starting high school as young in their grade. Okay? Yeah. But instead of me going forward, we kind of repeated eighth grade. And we didn't repeat eighth grade in terms of, I didn't get out the same books. I didn't, you know, have them do all of this again. Of course they were doing ninth grade work. And with a couple of my sons, they were doing a couple college classes, but we were calling it a grade again, because I didn't work with my sons graduated as old in their gave us that extra year to not only develop you know, mature wise, um, to help them find out who they wanted to be as young men, but mm -hmm. also it allowed us to earn more college credit that they could all graduate, um, with that advantage. That's a really good way to look at it. And it's really reassuring to just hear you have to, like you said, approach your child as a whole child, right? Like they're not just a mind waiting to be educated. They're a person, right? God has a perfect, beautiful design for them. And it's our job as parents to help them uncover right? So like they may be in a discovery phase, but we need to help them to uncover why they're wired the way they are so that we can lead them to that assignment that they're working yeah, on. I mean, to. We have a privilege of teaching them their academics in our home. Yeah. So it's, it's really um, a wonderful opportunity for us to be that influence and that, that um, guide for our students academically, spiritually, mm -hmm. and in every way. So um, I do that because we think that they're experts that know better. A lot of interference with raising mm -hmm. our kids, particularly in the high school years when parents become a lot more intimidated and a lot less secure. If, if it's, you know, their first time, their first rodeo, right? Yeah. The first time going through and, and figuring out how to get their student graduated, how to get their student into either college or an apprenticeship or trade school or military or entrepreneurship or mission work, whatever that is, right? Yeah. The first time you go through it is scary. And so I, I mean, I do think that it's very easy um, to be negatively influenced by all of that interference that, that mm. goes on and all that propaganda that comes down the pike. Cause it's going to happen. If you don't have a high schooler yet, it's, it's going to happen. And, um, all of our kids leave high school at some point, either, mm -hmm. either we graduate them or another school does, but they're all going to leave at some point. And so, um, you know, we teach resourceful high school planning, which is just that. really your school, your way. How can we make it a little, a little better so that they can, um, you know, work ahead if you will. Yeah, that's beautiful. What are some of the things that you wish all parents knew about homeschooling? as it relates to college credit or dual enrollment? I think some of these you've probably heard before and and I hate to always you know say something if it sounds like a cliche, but I promise it's not when I say every student is different and therefore every parent should know that their high school can look different. Mm -hmm. So if you have a student who is musically gifted, their high school, obviously within your state laws, if you have them, right? But their high school can be unique to, to emphasize and to take advantage of opportunities in music. If you have a student who has, a, has sports as a talent, you can do that. You don't have to follow this, this recipe to a T, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if, if you think of, of all of the different classes that you maybe would have experienced as a high school student, take that times a hundred times a thousand. I mean, there are more classes than you could ever take advantage of. And, and so don't be afraid to kind of zero in and work within, within that, um, using my oldest and my, and my youngest as examples, because there's such a stark contrast between, yeah. between those two, they're 10 years apart. And so I was a lot smarter <laughs> at the, at the end, but my oldest, you know, I was very driven in, in terms of giving him really strong academics. And, and I don't, I'm not saying I regret that, but I was not listening to where his talents and gifts and interests were. Mm -hmm. With my youngest, 
he very early on wanted to be a welder and I would not have given permission to pursue that as, as well as we did if he were my first, because mm-hmm. I thought, no, I want you to have a four-year degree. You know, right. it's really important that you have these opportunities. By the time I had my fourth son, what I knew was that if, if he had that goal in his sights and it was fine with us for him to pursue that goal, which it was, this is a good profession then I wanted to be all in on helping him accomplish that. And so he started his welding classes in 10th grade and I redesigned what his math looked like. I redesigned what his English looked like. We didn't spend a lot of time on classes that weren't going to count towards his degree. We didn't need him for high school just because so-and-so on, you know, on some website said that you should have so many years of history and so many years of this and so many years of that. I mean, we just reconstructed it all. And um, he graduated high school with an associate's degree as well as his high school diploma at the same time. And his degree was in welding. And, you know, there's, there's classes he didn't take. He didn't take literature. He didn't take chemistry. He didn't take a lot of those classes that I would have pressured, felt pressured to have my oldest son take, but they weren't part of this plan. And so Mm -hmm. when you kind of listen to, um, you know, that, that, advice of, you know, your, your school should look a certain way. Mm -hmm. It makes it hard for you to be on your own team. And so I think that just having that courage to, to know what your laws are, right. If your state has graduation requirements, if your law has homeschooling requirements, of course, you're going to be compliant with those. But outside of that, you have other, other targets that you want to hit. And so don't weight yourself down Mm -hmm. by adding a burden when you may not even have to. Mm -hmm. And where are you located? I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Um, I'm in New Jersey and we have a lot more relaxed requirements than Pennsylvania. So it's, it's a lot easier here. Um, but first of all, the bravery that you're sharing right now, because it's not just bravery in terms of I'm going to curate this academic profile the way it needs to be. It's the ability to shut out everything else. Like I hear what you're saying. I hear your well-meaning intention. I hear you over here criticizing me, but like to be able to shut out all of that and even your personal thoughts of, no, it has to look like this. This is what it is. I think it's just such a courageous move on your part. So kudos to you for that. Well, and you know what, though, Ro? Yeah. I mean, we do that with them in elementary school, don't we? Wow. I mean, you, you have you know, most homeschooling parents feel very supported in elementary school when we do child-led learning, when we do, you know, uh, things like unschooling, or we do maybe a more Montessori Montessori. whatever it is, right? Whatever, whatever that looks like in your part of the world, we get a lot of support from each Mm -hmm. other, but that goes away in high school because in high school, parents very much buy into the propaganda and the notion that they have to do a certain thing. So why would you have all of this commitment to the child, right? And, and their development and, and homeschooling. And then when they hit ninth grade say, okay, now it's time for us to, you know, to follow this specific recipe and you throw all of that creativity out the window. Because you don't say it out loud enough. Like when you say mm -hmm. it, it makes absolute sense, but in your head, if you don't say it out loud, right? Yes. I, I know. Yes. Well, the only way that I can say that to you is because I mean, I went through that myself. So I have a lot of empathy, you know, um, about that struggle and about that, that journey to get to that place. (laughs) Yeah. And that's why these conversations are so important because when we're in isolation, we listen to the lies, we believe all the lies and we don't see the perspective. Like you say that I'm like, of course it makes sense. Why would you craft this unique blueprint for the child? And they're like, oh, We're at this age now, we're at this stage, throw it all away. It doesn't make sense. We have fingerprints that are different from even identical twins. Like why would we think that everything needs to be the same thing for everyone? Yes. And I'll tell you a secret that that is that getting into college is easy. I love it. I love it. I want you to bring that back Getting out is hard. Getting out is hard. (laughs) Getting in is the easy part. Um, But the colleges, their marketing is in admissions. And Mm. so what we see, what we hear, what we receive from the world is that getting into college is hard. And Mm. in fact, it's not, it's not about 85% of colleges would be what I would call open enrollment, which is to say they're going to accept 
everyone who is qualified to apply, which means a high school graduate with a, let's say a 3.0 grade point average. Wow. So if you Another just, lie we believe. It's hard. Take, I can't do it. Yeah. Nope. Take, out of, take yourself out of that crazy. Now, of course, if you're choosing one of the colleges that are going to have a bottleneck of applicants, then it is going to be hard to get in because that's where all of the public schools are sending their college students. Mm -hmm. That's where the counselors maybe are familiar with. And so you get a lot of those bottlenecks at certain schools um, yeah. for certain reasons. It has really nothing to do with academics, a lot to do with brand name or prestige or, or marketing dollars. But um, there's about 4,000 colleges in the country and most of them desperately want your student. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I would not have known that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, there's one thing that illuminated so heavily for me when you talked about that, that checklist that we're following. I have the youngest children. I have four sisters and I have the youngest children. And we keep having these group chats and conversations about, do we want to do for our children the same way we did it? So for example, for me, I did the adult checklist. I went to high school. I got my college degree, then I went to get my master's, then I worked at this job, and then I met my husband, then we got married, then we had children, and I followed the technique, right? I'm doing work right now that has absolutely nothing to do with my degree, but I'm so energized. I have friends who are lawyers and doctors, and they're like, I wish I had followed something else. Not necessarily their passion, but not necessarily the thing that everyone told them would be the right thing, right? The accountant, the doctor, the engineer, the lawyer. And it's so interesting that we see cycles that don't necessarily work and we still follow them, right? So like for you saying, my son wants to be a welder, in your head with your checklist, it's like, no, you need to go to college and get a four degree, four year degree. But then we look at, and I wanna be careful, I'm not saying money is the, like my, success is not about money, right? So it's not like, okay, you have all these people who didn't finish high school and they're making all this money, right? That's not the point I'm trying to make, but it's everyone is not following that blueprint. And if you look at the ones who are following the blueprint, happiness or success or fulfillment may not necessarily be where they are right now. Right. And so that's one of the reasons that we don't tell parents what to do, right? Because each family has their own idea of what success and purpose um, need, you know, and how to fulfill that and what that looks like. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, so I'll say something unpopular, but I don't have daughters, but if I had daughters, it would be important to me at least, um, to have the conversation that they become homeschool moms. So that would be important to me. Now, that being said, would I then in the same breath, encourage my daughter to go off to college, to get a four-year degree that she has to borrow money for, and maybe mm -hmm. to grad school to have these enormous student loans to bring into a marriage. That would be a conversation that I get to have with my, my daughter that a high school guidance, guidance counselor doesn't have permission to have with my daughter. So wow. I get to have that influence over those decisions. Now I don't have daughters. And so I didn't have that discussion, but that's an example of how we, again, it's a privilege, right? It's a privilege to get to talk to our kids about what does life after high school look like? What is yeah. your purpose? How do you find your purpose? Mm -hmm. How do you find God's plan for you? Is it a certain job? I would argue that it's probably your life's purpose is probably not a job, right. uh, but it's probably more to that. Um, and how you earn money and, and all that goes into that is so complex, mm -hmm. but nobody cares more than you. Nobody cares more. There's no guidance counselor, college advisor, admission, none of them care about those, those long-term things. Colleges care about enrollment. Mm -hmm. right? And so their job is to enroll your student. Their job is not to wonder if they're going to have um, a career that, that can pay the bills, right? whether or not their student is satisfied um, with the career choice that they've made, whether or not they have student loan debt that's going to carry forward into their life afterwards. Um, those are not the concerns of the college. So whose concerns are they? Well, they're obviously our kids concerns, but how does our kids get guidance in that area? And that's from right. us. So when we have family values, we need to use our position of privilege and power to tell them, right? Someone yeah. is going to give them that counsel. If not you, then who? Right. Right. Cause it's not that it's going to be absent. It's just that 
It's just not you. So someone else is doing it. It is happening. So you want to make sure that you're the influencer in that situation. Right. Someone is, someone is going to say, you should do this job because it pays really well. Someone else is going to say, you should do this job because it has a really great lifestyle. Someone else is going to say this job, do this job because you're going to have a good work-life family balance. Someone else is going to say, do this job because you don't need work-life family balance. You want to be, you know, the next CEO, right. someone is going to right? So they're going to get this noise. And, and so we don't want to be quiet. We want to mm-hmm. talk to them about the important things and the values that we've spent all these years trying to instill into them. Right. And, you know, so one of the things I talked to my sons very frankly about is that I do expect them to be able to support a house, <laughs> you know, as men in their family, yeah. I, I want them to be able to have have make a good, sometimes they're the same thing, but they could be different. You know, I work as an executive director of a nonprofit organization that I do as a volunteer. So I give about 40 hours a week of my time to this organization. This is not what I was in college for. This is not, this is not paying any bills. Right. But I feel Mm -hmm. like it's important and it's, and I do believe that it's my purpose. And so you can, you can create those opportunities, what would, you know, what would a, a high school ga- guidance counselor have told me if I had this idea at 17, you know, mm-hmm. they would have steered me away from it. Right. So, you know, your, your child, your son or daughter is going to have their own journey, their own path. They're going to have, you know, different, different needs and, and challenges and things like that. So there's really no, nothing perfect that we can do for them at this phase, other than, you know, connect them strongly to their family give them a good foundation, a good education, a good spiritual basis, and then, you know, help them kind of figure it out. Wow. You are such a wealth of information. I don't even want to put you in a box by asking you a question. What else do you want to share? What else should we know? Like, I just want to give it as big and vague and broad as possible to not stare you. Just tell, what else should we know about anything? (laughs) It doesn't even have to be about high school. I just want to, I just want to download everything from your brain. Oh my gosh. Well, let's see. I, I would say uh, a couple of things. High school is a great time to homeschool. A lot of parents might be nervous about that and decide around eighth grade that they, that's a good time to drop out, put them into a school so that they can get into college and all of that. Um, I would encourage them to not, not do that. High school is probably one of the best times to homeschool. I enjoyed high school homeschooling with all four of my sons for different reasons. Um, we had uh, here in North Carolina, we have an opportunity to bring in college courses into our homeschool through the community college. And so we took advantage of that, but we also took advantage of lots of other types of college credit. My sons all had a lot of autonomy in terms of picking what those school courses were, the college courses, the homeschool courses. And what happened, at least for us during high school is we started that I was still very much the homeschool parent, very much doing a lot of the driving. But in high school is when you see a lot of maturity. And as your son or daughter starts to get these classes with other people and with adults in a very protected, guarded kind of way, right? Because we're still homeschooling, but they start getting exposed to these things. They really do start to grow and mature and and really um, usually come into their own in terms of, you know, becoming young men. And so I've just been uh, really just so blessed to be a part of watching that. Um, from the front row. And, you know, I, I do think that it's the probably my favorite time to homeschool because, you know, we're not struggling with the things like the reading and learning math and (laughs) how to, you know, how to do all those things that we struggle with in the beginning. They, they already have those kind of those skills. And so there is a lot of frosting on the cake that comes from high school. So it's like reaping the fruit, like everything that you put in, now you're actually seeing it come to fruition. Oh, yes. And you know, we were pretty fortunate. All of our kids were able to finish their college within a relatively quick amount of time because they had started, you know, so ahead. Um, and so they all lived home while they did that. And, um, they, they were able to still be at home and and do that. Um, so we were able to see them graduate, you know, both times. Uh, okay. and it is just really nice. Yeah. All right. So tell me the age of your children. Cause I know about the oldest in the middle, tell me like what yep. the age group is. And then in terms of independence and doing high school together or doing school together, how did you manage your time? Because obviously each child is different. So a five-year-old could work independently where a 10-year-old probably can't, right? Because right. it's just personality. Like, how did you manage all of that? 
age gap. So my youngest is 19. My oldest is 29. Um, my middle two are only two years apart. Okay. So my middle two, uh, it made sense to do a lot of co-teaching with them and mm -hmm. having them share subjects. Um, but because they're all so different, you know, it, it was, uh, it was difficult. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it was difficult to try and have everyone working independently or even as a group. I mean, because that, that has challenges too. Um, I can think of one example, um, that, that I would look back on and say, we should have done more of that. My, my third son was doing high school chemistry and there, my youngest son was, was not academically able to do, you know, 11th grade chemistry. However, he really liked the science experiments. And so for his science, you know, he did the labs that my oldest, that my older son was doing at that time. So they always did Friday labs together for chemistry. So my oldest son, you know, he, his chemistry textbook was a college textbook, but my youngest was using a middle school um, you know, textbook for science. And he got to do all the experiments with my other son. And so, you know, we just adapted it and we made it work. Again, the flexibility and just really defining the blueprint for your family versus following a structure or a checklist. Yeah. I hear you. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Well, I'm really excited to get to come to the conference. I will say I was thrilled to get invited we have a good population in Pennsylvania and um, Pennsylvania is not too far from me. I have, I have been away from my home very little since COVID. I haven't gone to homeschool conferences and conventions really too much since then. And so it'll be really great to get back out there. That's, that's what I love to do. I love to talk to other parents. I'm always learning what other parents are doing mm -hmm. and um, you know, just getting that one-on-one -on -one opportunity or, or one to many, I guess, depending on how mm -hmm. it goes. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. We have, we have three workshops that I'm going to do. The first one, I'm going to teach how to homeschool for college, how any parent with kids that are either on grade level, below grade level, or even above grade level can start to bring college credit. And it's not, you don't need to have a genius kid to start bringing in college credit. The son that I mentioned who started in 10th grade, he wasn't reading until he was 10. So he is not a genius by any stretch of the imagination, but we made that work. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then we're going to do another one. We're going to talk about earning credit um, by exam, which is a really great alternative for Christian families because you get to use your homeschool curriculum. You can use whatever curriculum you like, and then your student can test out of college classes. So they never even have to do them. And mm -hmm. a lot of parents like that because it gives them the control of the content. Right. And so you're, and, and by the way, that's a free option right now because there are some vouchers that parents can use and it is literally free college credit. It's not like free with an asterisk. It's literally free. And then um, there's a good number of Christian colleges that offer dual enrollment, which is where mm -hmm. your student takes a class, usually online. And that class is for high school and college credit. At the same time, the parent awards the high school credit and the college awards the college credit. Mm -hmm. So as an example of how that looks, let's say instead of 12th grade English, maybe your son or daughter takes English 101. And so that's how you kind of replace a high school class with a college class. Yeah. So those are the three subjects that we're going to, or the workshops that we're going to talk about uh, at the workshop. And um, yeah, and, and we're going to have lots of opportunities for questions and answers too. Perfect. Thank you so, so much for your time. It has been a privilege getting to know you, hearing about your story and just me being personally encouraged and reassured about this journey and just sharing with everyone that yes, you can, you can do it and you can do it well. So thank you so much. Yes, you can. Thank you, Ro. I appreciate you having me on. My pleasure.